signing of the Employment Equity Bill by President Cyril Ramaphosa continues to receive mixed reactions. It allows the Labour Minister to set specific equity targets for different sectors. Now, the President says it will promote diversity, equality and transformation in the workplace. However, the DA and Trade Union Solidarity saying that the bill is unconstitutional. It will keep businesses small and further cost thousands of jobs. Concerns that have been raised that it's not transformative, this bill, but rather will further entrench those racial divisions that exist within South Africa. The ANC, supposedly a non-racial organization, has turned to this extent to racial race-based legislation in determining who's allowed to work in which company. The new rules mandate bosses to take steps to achieve equity targets or face financial penalties. The bill gives the minister too much power and in fact in light of how governments fail to implement BEE policy that this is not the way to go. Unemployment in South Africa is expected to continue to rise. Does South Africa have the worst unemployment rate in the world? Business is already under so much pressure trying to navigate load shedding. You are going to strangle economic growth and ultimately you are going to see more job losses taking place. Hello South Africa and welcome to this live broadcast. I am your host Nazli Sharif. The story dominating the headlines right now is the introduction of the ANC's newest Race Quotas Act. This act aims to further entrench racial divisions and allocate employment equities according to skin color rather than people's abilities. South Africans do not need more barriers to start businesses or to find jobs. It's already hard enough. The ANC perpetuates that they are non-racial. However, with this Race Quotas Act, it proves that they are obsessed with race. The ANC has failed to unite South Africa. Instead, they continue to try and divide us. There is a much bigger story behind the headlines, and this has proven to be a very controversial issue with a lot of support for the DA's rejection of the act, but also some criticism and confusion. With me in studio, I have DA leader, John Steenhuizen, the DA's national spokesperson, Sali Malazzi, labor lawyer, Michael Bagram, and councillor of the city of Cape Town, Tammy Jackson. Thank you and welcome. John, let's get straight into it. You've been very vocal around this new Race Quotas Act. Why is that? Well, because it violates one of the key foundational principles of the Democratic Alliance, which is non-racialism. And that is also a key constitutional uh, value enshrined in our constitution, where it says South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. But let me be very clear. The DA fundamentally supports advancement and opportunities for people in South Africa, particularly those who have been previously disadvantaged by the devastation of race-based policies. This is what underpins our economic justice policy, and it's also a key factor in the new economic policy, which we'll be launching in a few weeks' time. But race quotas do not address inequality because they mask the symptoms. And what we're seeing here is the ANC desperately going into an election with the only thing that they have left at their disposal, and that is the ability to divide South Africans by race. And let's be very clear, these so-called targets are not targets, they are quotas, and they are race quotas. There are significant uh, financial uh, penalties for businesses that do not comply, including up to 10% of their particular annual turnover. We believe that this is going to fundamentally constrain a number of things. Firstly, the ability of businesses to expand. Secondly, the ability for us in an environment where we have an expanded unemployment rate of around 42% and the largest youth unemployment rate in the world, it's going to make that unemployment crisis even higher and it's going to really add to the burdens of load shedding and many of the other friction costs that are inhibiting economic growth in South Africa. We believe that the fundamental approach to resolving inequality 
and creating more opportunities for people is through creating an equality of opportunity rather than trying to mask an equality of outcome at the end of a process. And this is where we call the ANC out because they have done nothing to focus on creating an equality of opportunity that will really address <coughs> inequality in South Africa. The prime example is education, which has been so badly neglected that almost any 1% of 10-year-olds in South Africa cannot read for meaning. It's a neglect of the opportunity side of the economy that has landed us in this situation today. Layering race-based quotas over the scars, wounds, and damage caused by race-based policies is going to make the situation worse. Mm -hmm. It is also important to note that this doesn't only affect minorities in South Africa, it also affects black South Africans and their employment prospects in a variety of provinces around the country. But I'm sure we're going to get into that a little bit more as we go on. Yeah, absolutely, John. We'll unpack it as we move forward. You can be part of the conversation on our social media pages. Please send us your questions using the comment section for our in-studio panel to answer. Remember to join the conversation online using the hashtag Fair Access to Jobs. Like and share this broadcast with your friends and with your family to get them to tune in as this issue affects all of us. We have our first caller on the line. Let's take a listen. Hi, my name is Rob from Krugersdorf. I'm a small business owner and at this stage we are really struggling with the current economical climate and the difficulties that load sharing has created. I wanted to find out from the DA, how will the race quota act further negatively impact the running of my business going forward? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Michael, Rob speaks about being a small business owner. What exactly is the ANC saying with this new Employment Equity Act and how does it affect small businesses? Well, ostensibly they're saying if the uh, business is under 50 employees, then they're going to get exemptions. But by saying that, they're saying that they know that the legislation is negative in the first place because why give small businesses exemptions if they don't acknowledge that it's bad for the business? The other thing is, if that small business wants to do business with government, they're going to have to sub subject themselves anyway to the race-based quotas mm -hmm. that have been set up. So the bottom line is that this is social engineering of its worst kind. And we're going to go right back to where the National Party was at the height, at the zenith of race legislation. It, I didn't think I'd see the day that this would happen, but here we are right now. We are looking at race-based legislation. Yeah. Solly, speaking of what, what Michael spoke about, surely this has some sort of resemblance to the Group Areas Act. I mean, as a coloured person, I can't move to the Northwest, for example, because I won't get a job there. Surely we moved away. We moved past <coughs> this thing. Absolutely. And, you know, Michael makes a very important point because what this appears like is cosmetic intervention out of recognition of the failure of the ANC government to address the structural issues that has contributed to where our economy is. And our economy is a state where it is shedding jobs, and it is doing so because of the wrong policies that the ANC government has taken in government. And as a result, South Africa is not an enabling environment to attract the investment that's needed to attract those jobs. And what we are seeing with this legislation, it is that it will lead to further discouraging employers and investors to invest, in our, to invest in our country. And what will happen is we've got very few jobs in our country. 40% of, of the, uh, there's 40% unemployment in the country. And as John said in his remarks, it affects all races, whether you're black, whether you're colored or white. And what will happen is that these quotas will also limit employers to appoint to the size that their business requires. And in the event, and it's an unlikely event because this is totally unconstitutional and it can be challenged, but in the unlikely event that it somehow passes, people will just stick to the bare minimum 
you know, and what that does is it cheaps job opportunities for black people, colored people, and white South Africans. Any employer who is looking to appoint someone into their business, their primary requirement is fitness for purpose so that that individual can perform. And now you are saying that you are removing that space so that there is no fair competition for people to be appointed. And that is so wrong to where we are. Yeah, Tammy, let's go into it. If this act is implemented, there are about 600,000 jobs that are at risk. Surely we can't afford this. Nasli, you are absolutely correct. We can't afford it, quite frankly. So the Africa's current unemployment rate as of the first quarter of this year stands at 32.9%, which is one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. And the DA has estimated that if this act is in fact at year two, about 600,000 jobs will be on the line. And these jobs and livelihoods are not faceless. They represent actual South Africans from across all demographics in South Africa. And what has become crystal clear over the last few years is just how obsessed the governing party is with semantics and controlling the race narratives in this country, mm -hmm. as opposed to actually providing practical solutions that will solve South Africa's unemployment problem. Instead of focusing on ad uh, aggressively uh, implementing economic reform in the country uh, that will heal jobs, what the government is essentially doing is it's interfering in multiple sectors of the economy and it's forcing the private sector to adhere to race-based uh, 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 targets that they deem as acceptable per province. Uh, and so someone once made a very, very interesting analogy around a pie and I thought I would share it with our viewers today. Let's for one moment just think of the economy as being a big pie, right? The state's role is to make sure that the pie is growing so that every citizen in the country can get a slice of that pie. But in the case of South Africa under the ANC, the economy, which is the pie in this analogy, has not been growing, right? And so what the state is essentially doing is it's making people fight for a slice of that pie and compete on arbitrary grounds and immutable uh, 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 on the grounds of immutable characteristics such as race mm -hmm. that nobody can control. No quali uh, qualifications are not taken into consideration. Competency, merit, none of those things are taken into consideration, just race. Mm -hmm. And so that is incredibly uh, problematic and people will soon begin to see over time that this act is basically racial discrimination masked as some sort of social cause uh, for the ANC. Yeah, just, just to add to that, if, if I may, because we have just over 11 million South Africans that are in the jobs queue. Mm -hmm. They're waiting. They'll, they'll probably never find a job if we carry on like this. The bottom line is if you look at the unemployment rate on the expanded definition, it is about 40%. But the problem is the youth and the un uneducated youth without a CV and only be able to get a job in the small business sector those, that business sector is now going on an investment strike. I deal with small businesses every day. And the bottom line is they're not prepared to invest in their businesses. They're saying, let's wait and see. Well, we can't. We're in South Africa. We need jobs now. The DA won't allow that to happen. We must ensure that the businesses create jobs. Yeah. John, the, the caller spoke about already struggling with load shedding, mm -hmm. already struggling, you know, with all the issues we're facing in a broken, in a broken country already, and this just exacerbates how more difficult it will to get a job. Do you agree? Absolutely agree. And, you know, there are a lot of friction costs in <coughs> South Africa. We've got inefficient ports, inefficient rail, load shedding, 8 to 12 hours a day. It is very difficult for businesses to keep their heads above water. What you're now doing, already forcing them to comply with the failed BEE regime, is adding now another layer of compliance where you're going to have labor inspectors going around the country, mm. you know, conducting racial audits on, on people, uh, which itself is going to open up a whole thing. But here's the thing, um, you know, these things, you know, and the ANC goes around talking about empowering people. These are disempowering. Mm. This is a regressive step. But it's also absurd <laughs> 
And it's frankly a dog's breakfast. And that's another reason why it should be withdrawn and we should go back to the drawing board and focus on things that can really focus on lifting people out of poverty into opportunity and focusing on creating equalities of opportunities. So for instance, let's look uh, if you are an Indian mm -hmm. South African or a business owner in uh, the Northwest province. The quote I see here from the stats is um, that you've got to have 0.1%. Be uh, and that would be the quota for mm. Indian people in the business. Now, let's think about the absurdity of that. One out of 50 is 2%. Mm -hmm. So if you hire an Indian person, you're in violation of the quota. But also, if you fire an Indian person, you're also in violation of the quota. So it is a complete, ill-considered dog's breakfast that Minister Nlesi has sucked out of his thumb and is going to cause immense damage to our economy and the employment prospects. But here's the thing, where the quotas also mm -hmm. are just completely absurd and where they discriminate against black South Africans mm -hmm. who've been previously disadvantaged through similar job reservation schemes that were perpetrated by the apartheid government. Mm -hmm. If you are a black female in the Northern Cape, the target is 15,2%. That means that a business owner who wants to open up a factory and employ 100% black females is obviously going to be prevented from doing so because the quota is only 15%. So it discriminates against minorities. It discriminates against black South Africans. It is a bad, bad set of regulation. It must be also be borne in mind that you can't retrench to make way for those quotas. The Act doesn't allow that. The Labor Relations Act does not allow that. So you're going to face the Labor courts for unfair retrenchment. Mm. And so one wonders how the government's actually going to try and structure that. They're going to have to restructure the Labor Relations Act, which was the, the p first piece of legislation signed in by President Mandela at the time to try and have equality at the workplace. Mm. We've now thrown that out with the bathwater. Mm. It's unfortunate. And we've had 20 years of employment equity. It hasn't worked. It's been a complete disaster. And if I may, um, I think we should, you know, see this for what it is. It is quite clearly a populist tactic by the ANC ahead of mobilizing for the next year's elections so that it is seen to be fighting somehow for a social cause um, and, and fighting the interest of marginalized communities. But the reality is that this legislation has been in place for 20 years. It hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it hasn't created the environment that will spare employment to be on the rise in South Africa. And it is further adding another burden for employers, you know, who must now scramble to comply. Yeah. And in doing so in the process, had the prospects of their business growth. Mm -hmm. But for me, the major effects of this is that employers are now having to, as Michael said, play a wait and see a, a game to see how this unfolds. Mm -hmm. You know, other employers will probably take this to litigation, mm -hmm. meaning that instead of investing in their businesses, they are losing money fighting mm -hmm. against the state. The state is there to help create the enabling environment for job creation to prosper. But it is constantly adding obstacles along the way that mm -hmm. frustrate employers. And what they will do is they'll go to other countries mm -hmm. where there is no such um, frustrating legislative processes in the way so that their businesses can thrive. And that is why the DA has taken the approach that it has taken. Because if we do not do this, the next step will be the imposition of who must be appointed into those jobs. We'll have political parties. The ANC has done this in the past. The EFF frustrates a lot of employers by through their labor desk, um, insisting on the terms of conditions. This will be injecting cater deployment into the private sector. And this is the path that South Africa does not need. And there's also something that we also need to dismantle because there's a propaganda being led by the ANC along this that, oh, somehow any opposition to this legislation is is not recognizing the historical injustice of the country that has mm -hmm. created or taken away job opportunities from black people. The reality is any implementation of this amendment will result in no jobs for black South Africans, white South Africans, and colored South Africans. Yeah, absolutely. We asked you to please give your comments, send through voice notes, give us a call, and we have a caller online. Let's have a listen. 
So it's surely not what we voted for for democratic South Africa. And so this is totally, totally discriminative. And we as the colored people are totally against this new act. And we want it scrapped because we are all South Africans. Yeah, I mean, I, I looking at some of the areas, in example, Ennerdale in Johannesburg, John, we see so many young people unemployed. You know, you go to Aldo's, you go to Saldana, you see so many young people unemployed. What would you say to the caller? Well, I would say I agree with her completely. I mean, we left this behind when we adopted our constitution, which has non-racialism as one of its key pillars. But secondly, how do you discriminate against people who were discriminated before mm. under the apartheid regime. They were not white enough under apartheid. And now what this bill is saying is that you're not black enough under the ANC. It is completely absurd. And it's going to lead to massive, massive uh, problems with race relations in the country as people start to, mm -hmm. to turn on each other because a government is pitting us against each other. How can you reduce a citizen of this country who is a constitutional being who is a taxpayer, who is somebody who wants to contribute to the country, how do you turn somebody into a decimal point in their own country? Mm -hmm. How do you say to colored South Africans, no jobs in, uh, in certain provinces? The target, the quota is 0.0%. This is not the South Africa that people fought and died for. This is not the principle of non-racialism. Again, I come back to the point. We have to focus on the real things that are going to address inequality and empowerment. Yeah. And this is where I agree with Solly. Mm -hmm. This is a bait and switch exercise by the ANC. Mm -hmm. Just like expropriation without, expropri uh, without compensation was a bait and switch to distract people mm -hmm. from this government's failure, mm -hmm. abject failure, as pointed out by the High Level Panel Report, to deal with land reform in the country. This is a mask or a, an attempt to try and bait and switch people from focusing on the fact that this government has failed to grow the economy, it has pushed people into the unemployment queue, and every single day it works against job creation and investment in this country through the terrible policy decisions that they take mm -hmm. and the terrible posturing of this government. And that is why, mm -hmm. if we're going to leave racist laws like this behind, if we're going to grow the economy, we're going to have to get rid of the ANC out of government mm -hmm. and get a government in place that knows how to grow an economy. And here's an important point. 98% of all net new jobs in the last quarter were created in the DA-run Western Cape because we know how to grow an economy, we know how to get people into work, and we know how to ensure that people prosper and advance. The bottom line is, and I, I need to say this, is that the business community are feeding back to us and saying they'd rather import than manufacture. They'd rather computerize than employ more people. They'd rather industrialize and go to the fourth industrial revolution instead of employing more people. What is this doing to us? Where we stand at the moment in South Africa, we need employment. We need to ensure that the people who haven't got a job get their foot into the door of the employment. And the only way we're gonna do it, and as a DA government, we're gonna force our Minister of Labor to speak to the Minister of Education to ensure that the education matches what the business community needs. Yeah. Now, our minister, our current minister of employment and labor is looking for more and more control as opposed to letting go. But even his president has said that government shouldn't be creating jobs. The president said in the latest SONA that the small business community should be creating jobs. <coughs> so what does the communist minister do? He then creates a situation where we are now having more and more stranglehold on the business community. It doesn't work, it can never work. We saw the same with Idi Amin, what he did to the Indian community those many years ago. It won't work. Mm -hmm. John, let's unpack this a little bit more. Many people in the ANC argue that race quotas are put in place to empower people. But is this really the case? Because we've seen this movie with BEE, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Of course, and of course, you, we've seen already in the last few weeks the ANC straw man argument. Their straw man argument is that if you oppose these quotas and targets, you're opposed to transformation or trying to address the imbalance of the past. Nothing could be further from the truth. And as I've said, 
the unintended consequences of these absurd quotas are actually going to affect all South Africans regardless of, of your race and it's going to cause economic harm. And let's use BEE as an example. Now, no, no, no matter how noble the intentions were at the time and you know, those high lofty ideals were pronounced, the reality is that black South Africans households are 10% poorer now than they were at the beginning of the BE process. Black unemployment in South Africa has reached record levels in the country. And there's been nothing broad-based or economic empowering by this policy. It has empowered a very small elite who continue to profit greatly at the expense. It is the ultimate insider-outsider stitch-up where you have a well-connected group of people at the center who work very hard to suck up all the opportunity and lock out of opportunity the 30 million South Africans who live in poverty in the country. And that is why we're paying 2,000 Rand for a, a mop at Eskom. Mm -hmm. That's why we're paying over 800 Rand for knee pads because it is a price gouging. And what that actually does at the same time is crowds out the social spend where we should be focusing our education system, uh, keeping people safe, making sure we're creating and expanding the economy to create jobs and, as Tammy said, grow that pie mm -hmm. for more South Africans. Mm -hmm. Instead, the ANC is focused on stealing and on corruption and on elite empowerment. It leaves the 30 million people on their own to fend for themselves. It leaves the millions of people who are unemployed on the sidelines of the economy. And then, has the, to add insult to injury, comes up with nonsense like this and then expects people to believe that this is a government that's really interested in transformation. It is, it is an outrage that this government would even consider doing something like this, knowing the harm that it's going to do to the long-term prospects of the economy and the ability of ordinary South Africans, regardless of color, to be able to get the one thing that will bring more equality to this country, and that is a job. Sally, um, you know, the ANC says targets. Yeah. We know it's quotas. Can you speak more on that, quotas versus targets? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's all deliberate in the form that the language of it, again, is for social mobilization, for the outcome with the elections in mind, because they know this is the kind of language that galvanizes their eroding support, right? The, the, the limitation with targets, unfortunately, is that they cheat opportunities to far more deserving people, right? They cheat opportunities by removing fair competition um, to deserving job seekers or deserving employees who should be retained by employers. And what it does ultimately is, and you can tell from the two voice notes that are from the two callers, their sentiment that it heightens racial tensions in the country. And those then manifest themselves again in the workplace. And that's when you'll have these instabilities that are taking place. So it is quite important that the state in its actions <coughs> by spirit tries to incentivize businesses to do business mm -hmm. so that you can create employment, not put barriers to businesses to create employment and further put measures that are punitive to discourage businesses from thriving because ultimately who suffers is anyone who is a job seeker. Absolutely. You know, unemployment in the country is as it is now, it affects unemployed white South Africans, unemployed colored South Africans, and unemployed black South Africans. So what the state should be doing at this stage is to be focusing its energies is how do we make South Africa a country that is conducive to supporting more businesses? We need support for small businesses. We need government to remove barriers um, in the form of red tape in government so that the competition for doing business with the state is fair. The competition for businesses to survive is also fair. That's how success Successful economies grow. Mm -hmm. Michael, you as a labor lawyer, you get to work with businesses and workers mm -hmm. almost on a daily basis. Has race-based legislation really empowered previously disadvantaged people? Absolutely not. In fact, what it's done is it's a handbrake to job creation. And the DA has focused on that and said well, we need to remove that handbrake completely. It doesn't work. We've had 20 years of employment equity. When an ANC government is in a hole, they keep digging. So what do they do? We have a minister who now wants to make it worse. He wants to try and 
creates more impediments on the legislation. It just can't work. And then you have a look at the regulations. The regulations are, quite frankly, poppycock. You try and try and understand it. It's it's impossible to mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. And the other the other issue is there's nothing in the regulations as to how you can determine who's black, white, coloured, Indian, whatever. How do you determine mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. We have to go back to what the Nats did mm -hmm. and now try and say we're going to have a race based regulation. We will get inspectors to come and inspect each person. Now, how embarrassing is that to say, if I identify as coloured, who's going to come and tell me I'm not? Mm. I mean, it, it just is ridiculous. So we've got this, when, and we don't have inspectors anyway. We've only got 2,000 inspectors for the whole of the country with, I don't know, probably half a million businesses in the country. Mm. So where are they going to get this? It's just impossible. So all you have to do is put down that I'm now met the quotas and you, anyone can just say, no, well, they now identify as that and they'll be part of that and we'll, we'll mm. now we'll meet your quotas. Mm. It's all nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. That is engineering of its worst kind. Mm. I think Michael makes a good point mm. and that's that once you go down this road, yeah. You end up back with the petty apartheid yes. that we saw under the National Party, yes. where you're going to have to determine you know, where people live, mm -hmm. uh, where people can work, mm -hmm. and also coming back to determining mm -hmm. how you determine somebody's race. Yeah. And, I mean, the National Party used the dreadful pencil test as, as to, to show the level of pettiness. Mm -hmm. Are we heading back that way now where labour inspectors and others are going to be having to administer these degrading race-based tests when 30 years into a democracy under a constitution that says it belongs to all who live in it, you know, we're going to subject our people again to the inhumanity and pettiness of this type of, uh, of, of measurement. Yeah. We're going to have this ridiculous situation where people under apartheid would apply to court to have them determined to be coloured, Indian, mm. black, whatever. Mm -hmm. People used to go to court because they needed to to be able to get that job or to live in a specific area or do something. We're now forcing South Africans to go right back to where they were at the worst of apartheid in the 60s and 70s. It's a, a disaster in the making. Yep. Tammy, I mean, as young South Africans, it's very disheartening to hear that we are regressing. You know, almost half of South Africans are unemployed. Already, it's difficult to get a job in this country. And we saw this past weekend in the newspapers that ANC ministers blew 93 million rand on their ministerial homes. 93 million rand, that is crazy. Is the Race Quota Act just another scam to empower ANC cadres? Uh, so, Nasli, I'm actually glad John uh, made reference to lofty ideals and intention in his previous response because this is exactly what this act is. And I think South Africa's biggest problem in the legislative space at the moment uh, is this massive emphasis on intention and this almost blind obsession mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to intention, right? Um, uh, we never, we hardly ever focus on the outcome of of, of legislation or bylaw or a policy. Uh, in South African discourse, we always just focus on intention, and I think that's where one of the first problems come in, uh, because what we should actually be talking about is the outcomes and the consequences of whatever bills and acts uh, 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 are in Parliament, um, because those are the things that actually have, you know. Those are, they have implications on, on people's lives. And so the Employment Equity Amendment Act at face value seems morally and socially just, but in fact, it's really not. And I think, we've, I think it's fair to say that South Africa, you know, finds itself in a state where I can honestly say we are living in an Orwellian country where the government genuinely believes that the only way for them to address uh, the consequences of apartheid is to use more apartheid tactics in order to fix things. And that's just not going to cut it. Well, yeah. you've, you've seen in the legislation itself, the amendment has given the Minister of Employment and Labour the power to determine the quotas. He said he will consult with the community and with the business community. The problem is consultation is notoriously 
ridiculous yeah. because it doesn't mean that you're going to negotiate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to take anything into account. What he's going to do, he's going to consult. So what does he do? He gives people 30 days. We've now only got about 15 days left mm -hmm. to consult. But he made it absolutely clear at an employment um, portfolio meeting that he's made his decision and that he's going to implement that. So even the consultation process is a farce. Yeah. So yeah. where we stand at the moment is government makes it look good mm -hmm. by saying we'll consult. Mm -hmm. But consultation doesn't mean taking into account. Mm -hmm. And he certainly won't. We've got business communities, for instance, the engineers um, here in the Cape province are planning to go to court because mm -hmm. no one's spoken to them at all. Mm -hmm. They're going to put in their, their tuppence worth to the minister. Um, they're about to do that next week. But I have, I have seen the papers they want to hand in. It won't be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is the minister doesn't care. He's hell-bent on implementing. And I think <coughs> that raises another important point because this is clearly government bullying um, of employers in the economy, but it also just shows the abuse of executive power by the minister to impose um, his ideological preference on the South African economy. And that is what we should be pushing back against because ultimately um, this, the future of this government is also not intact. We've got an election next year, right? right? We've got an election, and which is an opportunity to fight back against such regressive legislation that locks people out of opportunities. And I hope South Africans, in their interaction or consideration of how to play a role in terms of the future of the country, are mindful of these developments because there is an opportunity that presents itself next year to correct all the injustices that is happening by voting in a dear government. Yeah. Speaking about uh, people in the country, I'm told we have another caller on the line. Let's take a listen. Um, I hear what, what, everything that you guys are saying, but um, could you tell me if not quotas, then what? Is the DA really just running away from ensuring that there's transformation and empowerment uh, in South Africa? What's happening? John, as yeah. the caller asked, if not quotas, then what? Well, that's an excellent question, and, and thank you very much for, uh, for that question. It's about growing the opportunity side of the economy. And again, you know, this is the cop-out that the ANC has made. And as I've said, these regulations are a mask for failure to grow the economy and to create jobs. How do you grow an economy? Well, you create a conducive environment for business to flourish because when businesses flourish, the economy grows, people are employed, and the rising tide lifts all the boats mm -hmm. in, in the harbour. Mm -hmm. And it ensures that everybody is, is given that opportunity. But we cannot have an equality of opportunity while we have an education system that still discriminates against rural, um, rural children and children from less uh, uh, affluent suburbs. And that has got to be a focus. It is an indictment that the president would be fiddling around with these type of quotas and not sacking the education minister on the back of the fact that 81% of our grade four ch uh, children cannot read for meaning. How do you compete mm -hmm. in an economy? How do you even go put a CV together? How do you go into a job interview if you cannot read? Yeah. A safe neighborhood where people can raise their families. A, a insurance that people have got access to decent public health care. These are the building blocks that create an equality of opportunity. And if you get those building blocks right, right from ECD level through to university access level, you start to ensure that there is a greater equality of the outcome because you focused on creating an equality of opportunity. And this is exactly what the DA government is doing in the Western Cape. And it's why, I've said, just think about that. And I mean, this is a statistic that that, that every South African should have written down when they go into the voting booths next year. 98% of all net new jobs were created in the DA-run Western Cape. Think about that. All other eight provinces together under the ANC's empowerment processes and, and, and policies only produced 2% 
of all net new jobs. Mm -hmm. Yet the DAs focus on creating that equality of outcome, which is why we focus on education, mm -hmm. education, education, and the outcomes at that level. Mm -hmm. We focus on attracting investment into the province. We focus on infrastructure and ensuring that infrastructure is able to promote business growth and opportunity. And sadly, that is not the case in other provinces where infrastructure is falling apart, the education system has collapsed, the government is more intent on stealing what it can from the mouths of the people it's supposed to serve than it is on ensuring that the people of the country have a better access. And it is grotesque, and, and Tammy uh, referred to it, it's grotesque, mm -hmm. that we're paying over 400,000 Rand to fumigate the cockroaches in a minister's house when we've got three-year-old children dying in indignity and pit latrine toilets at schools in this country. That shows you this government does not care. And we must not be fooled, and we must not allow them to fool the people of South Africa that they care by putting on the table these absurd targets. Mm -hmm. This is a stitch-up designed to distract South Africans' attention from the fact that this government has failed to do the things that any government should be doing, and that is growing the economy and ensuring the equality of opportunity. Because if we do that, then the caller would surely be able to see that more and more people are lifted into opportunity. We've grown the pie, and there's more to go around for everybody. And you don't then have to squabble over the crumbs in an economy, reduce people to decimal points in their own country, um, as this poverty of uh, ideas before us uh, you know, is, is promoted. But also, Nasli, I wanted to add to that. This entire idea of racial quotas is nothing new. We've had racial quotas in the country for the last 20 years. And my question to the caller is, if something has not worked for the last 20 years, why would you want to continue with that same failed idea into the future? Yep. And this is why I agree with Solly when he says that this is nothing but an election ploy for the ANC. If you read through the uh, preamble of the act, you know, it, it, it comes across as, you know, it's very social justice -y, the ANC standing up for the rights of people. But the ANC knows how to use the power of language in politics because they understand that language is a currency in politics. And so the last, for the last few years, they've been able, you know, to be fairly good at that fight. And so I think it's important for South Africans not to be blinded by what the preamble, the introduction to this act says, because at the end of the day, it is a racial, uh, or a racist act. That's yeah. really what it is, period. Well, the yeah. bottom line is, can you imagine the scramble once these regulations, if they ever come in, God forbid, but can you imagine the scramble to everyone to go, and go to a province where they'll employ more coloured people or more Indian people and be like, a, um, you know, playing musical chairs with South Africans being forced out of their homes because mm -hmm. they got to go and find a job elsewhere. Yeah. That's reminiscent of apartheid. Yeah. It has to be because you can't get a job in your province, you've got to move to another province and you've got no hope of getting a job there anyway. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a complete mishmash. But it's also an absurdity. I mean, I was just this last weekend in Chatsworth in, in KwaZulu-Natal and the targets there do not take into account regional demographics as Correct. well. Mm -hmm. So you've got this absurd situation where in a place like Chatsworth, mm -hmm. which is an overwhelming Indian population, mm -hmm. the target there for in the retail space is 3.6%. So you can only employ 3.6% of Indian South Africans in Chatsworth in a retail environment. It's, it's completely absurd. Does this mean that people are going to have to leave their homes mm -hmm and travel to other provinces to find work where the quota is maybe a little bit more uh, acceptable to them. How do people just up sticks and leave a community that they've lived in yep. their entire lives because they are being barred based on the color of their skin from seeking economic opportunities in that community? It, is, yeah. it just underscores the absurdity of it as well mm -hmm. and the ability that once you go down this road, you start opening up a million other doors that have massive unintended consequences. The minister must withdraw this mm -hmm. and let's have an honest conversation in parliament about how we can really deal with inequality in South Africa. Yeah, we asked you at home to send through your questions and be part of this discussion using the hashtags fair access to jobs. 
Please continue to let us know what you think. Send through your comments in the comment section if you have any questions. Um, panel, I'm told we have another caller online. Let's get straight. Let's get to it. I'm a South African citizen and I am a colored woman. I disagree completely with this government of South Africa for making a rule such as like colored people and Indian people included can't apply for certain jobs in certain provinces. Uh, I think it's totally wrong because we're not living in apartheid times anymore. We are supposed to be a rainbow nation, so why should we be excluded from jobs that we can't apply for? Yeah, couldn't agree more. Solly, tell us, how has DA government managed to create jobs, 98% net jobs, without using racial quotas? Look, I think that, that, that's an important thing. The responsibility of a government is to make sure that it creates an enabling environment to attract investment. How do you do that? You do that by doing the basics of governance and delivery right. You do that by managing your finances well so that you can use your finances to invest in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And if you look across all DA governments, Cape Town with being the shining example of it. It's investing millions into the infrastructure for basic services because what that does is it gives investors and employers the reassurance that the taps are running in this environment, their communities are safe, waste will be removed because businesses do not need disruption to their operations. Mm -hmm. So when there's that security and guarantee, it becomes far much more easier to do so. The contrast in other provinces and their um, I think it was Clover that had to um, move and close their plant in Northwest because the roads, um, no water, inter uh, water interruptions in that area meant that they did not have um, sustained and interrupted production in that area. So it's quite important to keep the focus in there. But you can do that, Nisley, if from the, base, uh, from the onset, you've got the right people yeah. in the right positions doing the right things. And that's what is an important distinguishing factor from how the DA performs in government compared to our counterparts. Mm -hmm. It's fitness for purpose. We get the right people in there and we get professional civil servants mm -hmm. to do their jobs mm -hmm. because we don't believe in cater deployment. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, the cumulative effect of that is things run on time mm -hmm. and things run well. And where the might not do, we take accountability and there are consequences. Mm -hmm. Those are important signals to employers and to investors that governance in this area is being taken seriously and there is a concerted attempt to do the right things. And the beneficiaries ultimately become mm -hmm. vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, vulnerable citizens because by doing that you are able to collect more rates, yeah. you are able to provide um, um, free basic mm -hmm. services to the indigent mm -hmm. and that is why you'll find that you know DA governments provide the highest basket of free basic services to vulnerable residents. I think it's important to just say as well that it's not an accident that yep. the lowest unemployment yep. rates in the country are in DA-run uh, metros mm -hmm. uh, and, and provinces. And mm -hmm. the Western Cape is, is an example. Mm -hmm. But I think Solly's point is excellent as well because a point that many people miss, you know, there is a greater benefit around clean audits, a government spending money on the people, not on politicians. And that is that the biggest beneficiaries, net beneficiaries, of good, clean, accountable government are poor South Africans because they don't have the opportunity to outsource or privatize their children's education. They rely on state schools. They, they are reliant on the, on the state health system. They're reliant on the SAPS and Metro Police to keep them safe. They can't outsource these things. Mm -hmm. And so when you have good, clean, accountable government that is delivering, the net beneficiaries are poor South Africans mm -hmm. who benefit from that which is why you have a better chance of getting a job in the Western Cape, a much better chance of getting a decent house, mm -hmm. there's decent public transport system, and there's more opportunity. And that's why people are flocking to mm -hmm. DA-run municipalities and provinces. People vote with their feet before they put their ballot in the box. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a reason why the semigration figures into the Western Cape are so high and why many businesses 
are seeking to relocate you because of what Solly's saying. Yeah. Investor-friendly environment, mm -hmm. a government serious about attracting jobs, mm -hmm. and focusing on the things that really make a difference, mm -hmm. not tinkering with the things that don't. Yeah. We need to salute the DA Premier and his cabinet who are doing everything possible to ensure that they are making government as much much of government as possible in favour of the business community. Mm -hmm. They're looking at how they can get rid of the red tape. They're looking at how they can tinker with some of that legislation that's not in uh, their, their power to change, but they're looking at it and they're busy working on it every day. And they are doing it and we've seen the results. Mm -hmm. John is absolutely correct. We've seen the results of job creation here in the Western Province. And we need to salute that, that group of people in the DA, in the BA Provincial Parliament. Yeah, absolutely. Where the DA governs, we get things done. Mm -hmm. Solly, let's be real. Yeah. Let's be real. Is this just new cadre deployment for the private sector? Well, it is structured that way, mm -hmm. it's written that way, and it sounds that way, and ultimately it has the same objectives, right? And that is why from the onset I said, the timing of this also reveals its true intention. Yeah. It is that it has in mind a major political development on the landscape of our country next year, which is the elections. The reality is that the ANC government is desperate to cling on to power. And this is an attempt to galvanize, you know, South Africans who are frustrated with unemployment. Mm -hmm. But the irony is that the biggest cause of unemployment in the country is the very same policies of the ANC government. And it's the very same actions of the ANC in government. It's the very same skewed priorities where you can have uh, billions being spent on VIP protection while um, our law enforcement officers are in shortage of the resources that they need to fight crime so that South Africans feel safe in their communities. Yeah. John, we've... We've heard comments from viewers, and people want to know where to from here. What is the DA doing, and how can they get involved? Well, the first thing is I would say to South Africans, don't let the ANC divide us. This is their election strategy. It's the only card they've got left in their pack. So let's not make this an argument about white, black, Indian, or colored. Let's make this an argument about our jobs or unemployment.